economies. The last example that I want to mention as a strategic fund, very different from the two, the, the, the first two, so Mubadala and Temasek. It's, it's, uh, they are, uh, it's a younger fund, it's Kazana National Behar, which is a fund from Malaysia, from uh, Singapore. In this case, they invest, uh, uh, it's like Temasek at the origin. At Temasek at the origin, they were investing domestically. They are doing the same. They are starting to invest a bit in Singapore, in India, in Indo Indonesia, and China, but you see the bulk, 90% of the portfolio is, is still stuck uh, in, um, in, uh, in Malaysia with exactly the same double objectives, financial returns and industrial returns. And in their case, they, they, they build a lot in medias and communication, infrastructure, also healthcare that is coming very, very uh, strongly right now. And they have these equity stakes in uh, automotive or healthcare uh, companies also that are uh, some of the biggest of, uh, of, the, of the country. So in, uh, in Latin America, we don't have the, uh, this type of um, uh, strategic funds. Maybe the one that is the a proxy could be a, a proxy, which would could be the, the BNDS. But BNDS is a, is a development bank, is very different from those uh, strategic funds. As you know, today in Latin America, there's discussions of what what to do with the, these these economics of plenty uh, in countries like Colombia. Here in Chile, there's already ex ex examples that we mentioned. There's other countries that are thinking what to do. The key always is to, to put this in a framework, in a fiscal policy framework, and obviously institutions are very key. But maybe some countries like Chile, Colombia, probably Brazil, could think twice in maybe with the right political economy of incentives that I was describing at the, at the beginning, uh, maybe to, to move them um, towards a strategic funds. And I want to do a last comment just to end uh, on, on time. Uh, there's two types of strategies for, uh, strate for, for, for those type of for, for, for strategic funds. One is uh, to invest the bulk of the money abroad. The other one is to invest the bulk of the money uh, uh, in, the, in the country. I think the case of Mubadala is probably the most interesting of all of the three that I mentioned, if you think about Latin America. Because one of the things probably that you, you need to, to learn from history, and there's uh, uh, history in Latin America that has not been very bright in terms of industrial policy, uh, is also to avoid conflicts of uh, agent. In the case of uh, the Mubadala, this is avoid because since the beginning, you are investing abroad exclusively in listed companies, public companies abroad, and you are looking for two things, financial returns and industrial returns. You are not investing in the, in the country, so you avoid all the, p the politics interference that you could have uh, within the, the, the countries. That's why probably it's an inspiring uh, example. And I will end with this last comment, uh, and to come back to my introduction, again, uh, if we were not convinced th that uh, best practices are also in emerging countries, well, uh, if you are here in Chile, probably you are uh, convinced, but, and this was also the, 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 the example that we're sharing, you have also best practice from Arab countries, best practice from Singaporean countries, and maybe what we are learning with this crisis is also to be more, much more humble and to look to those countries also as uh, uh, countries where best practices are there, even if they are not OECD countries, even better practice sometimes than OECD countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. Uh, I just uh, uh, need to tell you that Juan Carlos Echeverri, the, the Colombian Minister of Finance, uh, couldn't make it, so I, I apologize for that. I am really sure that uh, he's very sad about it. Uh, and we have a couple of minutes to take questions from the audience. So, anyone? was a question for the minister, but I guess that Ignacio Briones can take it. Um, I was uh, kind of surprised to see this uh, uh, Chilean fiscal rule uh, in terms of uh, uh, spending your permanent income, but uh, there is no reference to the tax structure. I mean, is the tax structure uh, uh, set in stone so you cannot adjust tax rates uh, to determine the permanent uh, uh, revenues? 
yes, you are right. This is a given. This is an input. Uh, I, I would say that if tomorrow we decide to change uh, the tax structure, to increase or to lower the taxes, the rule will remain exactly the same, but the input you will put in your formula will change, of course. Okay, but the, the, the in a sense, the rule is the algorithm. Okay, and the, the rule says that, first of all, calculate your permanent revenues, and this is has to do with the cover, uh, revenues from Codelco and cover taxes, okay? And also with the remaining of the fiscal revenues that comes from tax typical taxation, which is associated with growth. And this is why one of the main uh, inputs is the long-term growth of the economy. But you are right, if we decide to change the, the tax burden, uh, certainly the estimate of the long-term revenues will change in permanent fashion. Okay, anybody else? I've got one for uh, Javier. And basically from a, uh, a political economy standpoint, uh, you would say that is, would you say that it's better to keep the money inside of a, a state-owned company that produces the money instead of uh, like taking it out and putting it in, a, in, a, in, a, in this kind of funds? Say, for, for instance, if you take, uh, if you keep the, um, the money inside the company, you can always tell a story well, uh, where you, you need the company to invest or, or, or whatever, no? Which is better? You keep it inside the company or, or you put it in, into a fund? Very briefly, I think uh, you can even do uh, both. Sorry, you can do both. In, in, the, in the case of, uh, um, of uh, uh, Sing Singapore, for example, Kazana, it's a way to organize the holding company of all the equity stakes of the state. So it's one answer. So you can organize uh, through through that way, and I think it, w it was an, an, in an interesting e exercise. And you have countries in Latin America that maybe are thinking of or could be doing uh, some type of exercise, which is a way to gain efficiency, which is a way maybe to professionalize a bit more the the, the holdings in the in the uh, national companies. Colombia has, Chile has, and and so on. Uh, but at the same time, and it's also my point. Maybe with the right objective and the right uh, uh, political economy incentive, you could also, for strategic fund, that invest abroad. And if you decide to build a cluster, an industrial cluster in aeronautics, like uh, uh, the Arabs uh, did, uh, you will be, it will be very complicated to do it from scratch. But they, they are managing to do it. You could do it. Here in Chile, again, I give the example of the extractive industry, the providers. Nothing is done. I mean, you don't have providers, very high value, uh, uh, value added uh, providers here. Caterpillar is not producing trucks here in this country. And, and, and this is not the number 10 in copper uh, in the world. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, so we close the session. Huh? It is an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce John Tirol, the speaker at this Jacob Mark Marshak le Lecture of the Econometric Society. John Tirol was the first teacher of the first course of my first day of classes at MIT in 1986. Yes, 25 years ago. I did not know anything about modern I.O. and game theory, and a friend suggested me to take the industrial organization course of Paul Josko and Jean Tirol. My English was lousy, still perhaps. <laughs> and, when Paul, and when Paul introduced the course, I got very little. And then came this young French professor with a strong French accent, and it was great. Perhaps bad for native English speakers, but great for Latinos. I really enjoyed the course, and I am really learned what a brilliant professor he is. At that time, we used a draft of his I.O. book, where everything seemed so simple and intuitive. But then, when I went to the original papers, they were be much more difficult to understand. I remember, I think that it was Milgram and Roberts Econometrica paper of 1982 on limit pricing. In Jan's book, there is a very simple version, two periods, two type of firms. The original paper is really difficult. And indeed, 
comparing the paper and the book was quite a challenge. As I learned from Jean, there were two possibilities. He was one of the two possible types. The first one was that he was cheating. The other is that he's incredibly smart. With rapid Bayesian updating, the separating equilibrium revealed that Jan was of the second type, an economist with an incredible mind. I was amazed about his abilities to get the point and illustrate it with rigor, simplicity, and elegance. I still enjoy and la learn reading his papers. This is my experience with I.O., but Jan has done path-breaking research in many areas, just to name a few. Industrial organization, regulation, game theory, banking, and corporate finance. The latter two are very relevant for central bankers. There is no point in going through his CV. With almost 200 papers, we would be impressed by his achievements and depressed about ours. Indeed, I think that as normal researchers, we have two choices, few very good papers or a lot of normal papers, not so influential, but that shape our way of thinking. Jean is one of the very few academics that have a huge lot of influential papers. He's top 10 in ideas database, has more than 60,000 60, citations in Google Scholar. He was awarded with Jean-Jacques Lafont, the first Ijo Johnson Award in 1993, a biennial award to the best economists in Europe under the age of 45, similar to a Clark Medal. Rudy Dombuch told me once, Jose, creativity to, the, to do real frontier stuff just lasts about 10 years. Someone concerned, I ask, what do we do next? And he answered, we write books. Some do policy, write speeches. Jan does not fit this pattern. He has done frontier work for over three years. But in addition, to fit some of Rudy's view, he has simultaneously written 11 books, and the 12th is forthcoming. Some of them leading textbook and obliged reference in many areas despite some have been written more than 15 or 20 years ago. What Jan has shown is that good research is not only about good execution and elegance, but above all, interesting questions, persuasive answers, and persistent influence. Although my knowledge about Jacob Marshak is more limited, I have read some in the last couple of days, he was also very versatile in terms of research. He had lasting influence in many areas such as growth theory, monetary theory, and information theory. He clarified the difference between identities and equilibrium conditions, something that still confuses many people, and worked in empirical macroeconomics while he was the director of the Coles Foundation. As Jean, he also was inter interested in interdisciplinary work, involving ideas from psychology and sociology. In 1926, he wrote about the new middle class, and perhaps we would reread it given current events in the world. He also did game theory, in particular communication and transmission of information, what he called the theory of teams. So it seems we have a great match between the lecturer and the economist that we honor in this lecture. Marshak even published in 1949 a paper on liquidity under complete and incomplete information and discussed different types of liquidity according to the informational environment. It is an honor for me to give the floor to Jean Tirol, who will talk about commonality of information, tranching, and liquidity. Yes. Thank you, Jose, for those extremely kind words. Um, it's a very great honor for me to be here to, the, to give the Jacob Marshak lecture. Um, and thanks a lot for the invitation. It's nice also to see some old friends, including Jose. Uh, year. So let me uh, just say it's a uh, joint work with Emmanuel Ferry with Harvard University. Uh, it's work in progress, I have to warn you, and uh, that's the first warning. The second is a little bit technical, so if you should be close to the screen if you want to see the equations. I apologize for that. Uh, let me say that um, you know, Jacob Marshak actually worked as, uh, on liquidity, worked on information and, uh, and the like, so actually it fits pretty well with what he was saying. It also fits very well with uh, Banks' wonderful presidential address uh, yesterday. Now, from, uh, from a pre previous work with Bank, actually, we, we have emphasized a lot the fact that uh, liquidity is important, financial institutions and organizations need liquid, liquid instruments 
to meet uh, cash shortages, uh, satisfy liquidity requirements, take advantage of possible mergers and acquisitions uh, opportunities. And what we are worried about is, is uh, the assets becoming illiquid, and they may become illiquid either because uh, sellers are worried that buyers might cherry pick the high quality assets or symmetrically, and that was Akalov's uh, fundamental contribution, that sellers trade only their lemons. Uh, and we have seen a lot in the recent crisis suspicion about the asset quality. Uh, so that's going to be the topic of this talk. And there is a huge literature on that, and here only a couple of references to the literature. Uh, those are very famous refer uh, references. But our particular work, which, by the way, is still not written, is inspired by Banks and, uh, and Deng and Gorton's point that information structure are endogenous, and so liquidity changes as, sec as securities are repackaged and circumstances change. Uh, people are going to start acquiring information, asking questions to use banks' language. Um, and the security to be liquid should be designed with an eye on their impact on information acquisition. So it's actually a very important point, and that stimulated us uh, to, to write uh, some, some more on the issue. Now, you learned yesterday that debt has two important uh, properties. First, it has a pretty low news sensitivity, so it doesn't fluctuate too much with exogenous news. And the second thing is that it minimizes information acquisition incentives. So if a debt contract, technically, if a debt contract encourages information acquisition, so does any contract that yields the same expected payoff. So, so that basically minimizes incentive to you have to acquire information. So bank didn't have much time to go through that, but you can illustrate this through a very simple diagram. Here is a debt contract. X is the underlying return, and the debt contract is written on X. So as long uh, the, the debt reimbursement is D, as long as X is greater than D, then you, you get paid D. Otherwise, you have the residual claimant for whatever is left. Now, if this debt contract is sold at a price P, the incentive of a buyer to acquire information about the, say, about X, to try to know what the real value of, of X is, is basically up to the densities described by this triangle. Actually, I don't know, I can, uh, yeah, I can try here. This is triangle here, basically, because you would like to know when it's a lemon, in that case, you will not want to buy. So basically, this area of the, of the triangle here gives you your incentive to uh, acquire information. And if you take any other contract, you know, S1 of X is another security return on X, uh, you see that the area is actually larger and that you have more incentive to acquire the information. Now, the contract, the optimal con no, contract is not quite dead. It's quasi dead because, of course, for returns which are above P, you don't really care. You're going to buy anyway. So, for example, S1 and, and, and SD here in this diagram are going to give you the same incentive to acquire information. Now you can go a little bit further that um, Dan Gorton Holmstrom did by, um, uh, and that was done by a student at Princeton, Ming Yang, who uh, introduced a more general information structure where you can buy intensity of information, you can specialize it in the distribution. So you can choose to get information for low returns or get information for high returns. In a current version of the paper, he looks at an entropy-based uh, cost measure, so the cost of getting a signal. The signal, you can restrict it to be zero, one. I buy or I don't buy, in a sense. And the private that you are going to buy is going to be a function M of X, so uh, where X is, again, the underlying profit. Um, the cost of information is basically based on the entropy, and he showed then that the optimal contract is a dead contract. Um, whether the information acquisition is uh, deterred or committed, which, which is endogenous, of course. So he has another result, which is going to be interesting. I'm going very fast because, you know, you, you can just advertising for, for his work as well, which is really a follow-up work on, uh, on uh, Dan Gorton Holmstrom. He has another result, which is actually uh, quite important, which is a liquidity effect result, which is, the timing is very much the same timing as in Dan Gorton Holmstrom. So you design a security, then you, you basically commit not to sell the leftover security, 
Uh, you, you sell the security, you set a price P for the security, and then the buyer decides whether to acquire information and then decides whether to buy the security. And here is, a, here is an example where you have the underlying uh, profit X, which has a minimum value B. You might think it's some kind of uh, collateral value. And S of X, which uh, also has minimum value B. Um, and it's always optimal if you want to basically trench off, uh, spin off the safe part B and sell, I mean, it may not be optimal to choose exactly that price, but you can sell at P minus B and sell separately as a trench part. And the reason for that is that if you sell at P minus B, the security S of X minus B, you basically have the same incentive for the buyer to acquire the information and the same amount of trade in the end. But at least the safe part you will be selling with priority one. And that's a very important insight, which is that uh, you take off the, the safe part, you sell it separately, and that way you're completely sure that you're going to sell it with priority one. Uh, you create a, liquid, a very liquid instrument, and the rest you may or may not sell it. Now, if you look at the literature as a whole, and that goes beyond those two papers, and I think of uh, Dan Gartham Armstrong as being really very important because it really shows you that you really have to think about whether people are going to ask questions about the security, um, which the previous literature didn't assume. The previous literature basically assumed that the seller knew the true value or the buyer knew the true value, but of course it's highly endogenous. So first inside, trenching is optimal, so you would like to create debt light securities to alleviate the buyer concern about the sellers disposing of their lemons, the echo of effect, or symmetrically, the seller is concerned about the seller's curse that the buyer wants to buy only high value items. Second thing is uh, ignorance is bliss. So security design should deter or at least encourage or dis discourage or, uh, or maybe deter information acquisition. Now what we do in this work with Emmanuel Ferry is to extend uh, their model and uh, that's the first contribution. There are really two contributions. The first contribution is to go a little bit beyond and and ask two questions. The first is, is ignorance bliss? And, um, and the, the answer is yes, because the literature looks mostly at situation when, in which at most one party can acquire information. But of course, as Banks says yesterday, liquidity stems really from the commonality of information. What's important is that we have the same information in some way. It's not ignorance per se. Ignorance is a special case. So sometimes, and there are some caveats to that, the call may be to encourage information acquisition so as to reestablish the symmetry of information. So that's just a technical point. Now, as to, the, as to whether trenching is desirable, um, I'm going to show you that it's not always desirable and for a very intuitive reason. Now let's go back to the basic model that you'll find in the entire literature, not only the, those two papers. So you design a security, you trench a security, and then you commit to, say, to a price P for the security, and you commit not to sell the other part, the leftover part. Then the buyer decides how much information to acquire, and then there is a buying decision. So there is a strong commitment not to sell the other security, but the question is once the information has been, has been deterred, information acquisition has been deterred, and, and so the debt claim has been sold, why, why not sell equity after all? Because you have gains from trade also on the equity part. And if you trench, uh, if you create a low information intensity security, you also create a high information sec intensity security. And what is the impact on the overall liquidity? So do you have some kind of Modigliani Miller result uh, with that? Now, the question comes to, are you able to commit not to sell the leftover security, the equity part? And the answer, in my view, and we don't really have a model for that, is that it really depends, which is in normal times, probably you are able to commit to keep you know, this, uh, this equity part, this equity trench. Now, when you, are, you get big benefits from selling the equity trench, you may not be able to resist the temptation. And I think one, one thing we have seen in the recent, before the recent crisis, that actually um, the issuers actually kept very little of the equity trench. 
and actually sold much more than, than the safe part, which they used to sell before uh, the, 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 pre the previous decade. So it really depends. You know, sometimes you actually might not be able to commit not to sell uh, the leftover security. So to just repeat, you have an underlying asset that's the bundling uh, part, so you, you might sell the asset as a whole, or you can trench it, and then you may create a low information intensity security, which is going to be very liquid, and that's really the liquidity effect. You, you create a security that you'll be sure you're going to sell, um, but at the same time, if you create a low information intensity security, you're also going to create a high information intensity security, which is going to be less liquid. And the key effect we are going to identify is that actually it's going to be less liquid uh, because there is no more collateral damage effect. And I should emphasize this effect because it's very intuitive. Those of you who have done I.O. will know it, but those of you who haven't seen I.O., they won't. Um, the basic point is that if you bundle the risky part with the safe part, any time you don't trade the risky part, you also don't trade the safe part, right? So that means there is a collateral damage of not trading, and that gives you more incentive to trade. Now the next point is that when nobody is informed, the incentive to acquire information is derived from the incentive not to trade. I'm a buyer, I don't want to buy a lemon, so I just want to be able to refuse when, when it's a lemon. I'm a seller, I don't want to sell a high quality asset. So basically, when nobody's informed, the incentive to get information is incentive not to trade. If you make not trading more costly, then that's, um, that's good actually. That deters information acquisition. And here you get the basic uh, first contribution of this paper, which is, imagine say that party I, I may be the seller or the buyer, is uninformed. Now party J acquiring information is going to generate less trade, that's what I was just saying. And bundling by making trade more desirable, because again, if you don't trade the equity part, you also don't trade the, the debt part, that's going to decrease J's incentive to acquire information, and that's going to be good. Similarly, when party I is informed, the incentive for party J to acquire information actually is to trade more, is to reestablish the symmetry of information. And bundling is going to increase J's incentive to acquire information, which is good because that's when you want to reestablish the symmetry of information. The second contribution of, of, of what we are doing is to apply this framework to repeated trading. The literature is almost entirely focused on a single transaction, so you trade only once. Now, a key feature of liquidity securities is that they change hands frequently. So the notion of liquidity then becomes a notion of velocity. How often does it change hands? So what we want to ask is what are the determinants of velocity? And how does the expectation of future liquidity affect the current liquidity? So if you expect liquidity tomorrow, is it going to make the claim today more liquid or more liquid? Okay. So to study those questions, we develop a dynamic model, which in reduced form is actually a special case of the static one, so we can just apply the results. A limitation of our analysis is that we have a binary outcome for tractability, so most of the literature actually consider, including Dan Gorton Armstrong, considers a continuous of outcome. And then there are a couple of technical things that we have to, we have to finish, uh, but doesn't look like there is any difficulty with that. So let me now uh, move on to the model. So we take a very standard model of um, gains from trade. We create gains from trade. Um, the value of an asset to a seller is equal to capital S plus small s times delta. So delta is going to be zero, one. It's going to be a random dividend. That's the equivalent of the X in the Dank Armstrong Gordon model. So delta is a random variable zero, 01, which is unknown. And for the buyer, it's going to be capital B plus small b times delta. Now there are gains from trade, and you have to verify this for every application, but you know, the reason why there is trade, of course, is there are gains from trade. So capital B is greater than capital S, and small b is greater than small s. 
delta is equal to one with sprite zero and to zero with sprite zero and minus rho. The important thing that you have to realize is that there are two interpretations for the fixed part. There is a fixed part. Um, it's going to be the safe return in a static analysis, so you can think of that as being the safe part in the static analysis. In the dynamic analysis, it's going to be the continuation valuation. When the, you are the owner of the asset, how much are you going to get as a continuation valuation? Okay? So there are two interpretations of capital B and capital S. We want both sides to potentially acquire information, so we'll introduce cost of information acquisition, CB for the buyer, CS for the seller. So that means that if you pay this cost, you get privately informed about, uh, the, the dividend, about the dividend delta, and it's an observe. There are bargaining power. There are bargaining powers. Um, we want to have, I mean, there is no reason in general why the seller should have full, uh, full bargaining power. So a very simple way to capture this is to assume that the buyer is going to make an offer with priority alpha B, and the seller is going to make an offer with priority alpha S. Now, almost the entire literature assumes that alpha is equal to one, but there's no particular reason for that. So the timing is this. You have an information acquisition stage. The buyer and seller then secretly decide whether to become informed. And then there's a bargaining stage with priority alpha I, the party I set the price, and then the party J can accept or reject. I should add, which is not on the slide, that the buyer and the seller are risk neutral, so um, that's it. You want to be concerned about liquidity uh, breakdown, so you have to introduce some kind of hackle of assumption. So what, what we do is basically assume that trade is inefficient when one part is informed and the other is not. So take, just to compare, for example, with uh, a bank's paper, when only the buyer is informed, okay? Now, if he learns that it's a lemon, so actually its value is only capital B, so delta is equal to zero, he's willing to pay capital B. The seller is uninformed, so it's, his reservation value is S plus rho S. Remember, rho is the probability of having a dividend of one. So the average value when you are uninformed and you are a seller is S plus rho S. You can show that if you have this condition, actually there is trading only if uh, the asset as a high value, okay? So the informed buyer will buy only high quality asset, and this is known. An informed seller will sell only a lemon, and this is known. So that means there will be inefficiency, and under trade, the uh, asset won't be fully liquid. Let me introduce the notion of trenching. So trenching is basically spinning off a fraction theta of the same safe part, so that you are going to sell separately. So what the average price at which you are going to sell it is the following. If, you are, if the seller makes an offer, which has priority alpha S, then it's going to sell at the valuation for, for the buyer, which is theta times B. I mean, you trench the safe part. If the buyer makes the offer, then the buyer is going to offer at theta S, which is the valuation for the seller. Now, Bundle with a risky part, which is a dividend link part, they will remain one minus theta B, one minus theta S. And if theta is equal to one, you just get full trenching. So you basically create a, a safe debt and a totally risky security. Um, let's talk about full trenching. It doesn't really matter. But here is the important, one first important insight is that when you trench, the layman's assumption is satisfied at, as fortiori. So that's exactly the collateral damage effect I was telling you about. Because when you trench, that means that the safe part has disappeared. You, s you trade it separately. So if you don't trade the equity part, then there is less of a loss because you're not trading the safe part either. You're trading the safe part elsewhere. So it, there is a lower cost of dis disagreeing. And that means that people are more aggressive in their bargaining behavior and that means that the Lehman's assumption holds a fortiori. So this is really important. You have to remember that if you trench off the safe part, it's less costly not to trade the risky part. 
and that creates more aggressive behaviors, and that results in less trade, okay, in general. Now, except for the binary outcome, the standard models, if the literature are special cases of that, they all assume the seller has a full bargaining power. Um, Marius Majlouf, De Marzo Duffy, and, uh, and many others assume the seller is informed and the buyer is not. Gotten and Penacci, which is another famous paper in literature, assume the reverse, so the seller is informed, the buyer is not. And the contribution of Dan Gotten, Armstrong, and Young is basically to point out this all should be endogenous. And in their cases, they focus mainly on, on acquisition of information by the buyer. Um, sorry, I have to go through a lot of uh, modeling, but once you have seen the modeling, the rest is simple. So I just want to, to go through that. The repeated trading version, again, the entire literature is about static trading. And you know, in practice, if we want to talk about velocity and try to understand dynamic liquidity, you really have to have a repeated trading version. And fortunately, we were able to get a case where we could solve very easily. So as I said, the motivation is that you like to know our future liquidity, which here affects, as we're going to see, the continuation value BNS affects the current liquidity. So to do that, we take a Woodford 1990s style model. So you, we have a population of type one and type two agent. For those of you who don't know Woodford, it's a pretty, it's a very interesting paper I found. It's a very short paper. It's in the AR papers and proceeding. Uh, but it's a very interesting paper. Um, type 1 agents have investment opportunity in odd periods, so they transform one unit of cash into R unit, where R is greater than, than one. R is the alpha in Banks' talk yesterday, so it's the same thing as the alpha in Banks' talk yesterday. Type 2 agents have investment opportunity in, ev in even periods, and again, in even periods, they're going to transform one into R. So they will want to trade back and forth the store value, okay? This liquid asset, hopefully liquid asset. The discount factor beta, that's where you see I'm turning into macroeconomist. Delta is a dividend and beta is a discount factor, so that's my claim to being a macroeconomist. Um, and the dividend delta T is IID, actually we're extending now to, to a more general thing, but for the moment, uh, dividend is IID. So and you can learn its value one period in advance. So you can acquire new information one period in advance. So the timing is here. Uh, at period 2K plus one, it's the agent of type one, which can com convert any cash value V into RV. Uh, so the dividend is realized. Then the seller and the buyer meet. Uh, they can, before bargaining, uh, try to learn the value delta T plus one of the dividend at T, T plus one, and then the bargain over, over the price and over the whether to trade. And then dividend at T plus 2K plus two is realized, and then it's a tap two agents which can convert cash value into V into RV. Now just to see how it fits with a static model, just take the buyer's valuation um, in t at 2K plus one. Okay, the buyer is type two, say. So if he buys the asset, he's going to pay price P. He's going to pay price P. And then tomorrow, which is discounted with discount factor beta, uh, it, will have, it will have delta, the dividend, which he can transform. There is no safe part here. The safe part will come from the continuation valuation. It's going to transform the dividend into R delta, um, where R again is greater than one. And then he will have VS, which is a continuation valuation of someone who has an asset and an investment opportunity. So you see we're right away what the B and the small b and capital B of the static model are. So small b is the coefficient of delta, it's beta times R. And capital B, the safe part, is beta times VS, beta times the continuation valuation once you become a seller. Similarly, you can do that for the seller's valuation. So the seller, if he gets P today, he transforms P to, into RP because the seller has uh, an investment opportunity. Now, if he doesn't sell it to the buyer, then tomorrow he's going to get the dividend delta, which he doesn't transform because he doesn't have any investment opportunity tomorrow. But then 
is going to keep the asset, and that's very important to understand because tomorrow he is a seller today, that means he will be a buyer tomorrow. And he, being a buyer, there are no gains from trade with, uh, with other buyers. The, by, and by the no trade CRM, is not going to sell tomorrow, so it's just going to keep it for one more period. And in two periods from now, so with discount factor beta square, is going to get R times rho, which is expected, rho is expected dividend, and then he will get his continuation valuation. So similarly, you can compute, and I'm not going to do that, you can compute the coefficient of delta, which is small s, and the fixed part, which is capital, uh, capital S, and you can check that small b is greater than small s, capital B is greater than capital S, so you have gains from trade, as we expected. Okay, so what I'm just telling you here is this Danik model where you can talk about velocity and many other topics is really a special case of the static game. So let me, let me tell you how it works. Um, so let's, let's take the case of Dan Garton and Armstrong where you, you have an uninformed seller. So the cost of information acquisition for the seller is infinite, but the cost CB for the buyer is finite, so the question is whether the buyer is going to get informed or not. So the first thing to do is to do like in DGH, you look at a non-informed equilibrium. So that's an equilibrium in which you expect the buyer not to get informed, the buyer doesn't get informed, and the security is very liquid. And here I'm assuming well, I'm assuming for the moment there is bundling, so you sell the entire security. So the seller is going to get, with priority alpha S, is going to make the offer, and is going to sell the security as, at what it's worth for the buyer, and the buyer has, has value, because the buyer is not informed, has value B plus rho B, okay? There's no information there, so you just reason in terms of expectation, so the value to the buyer is B plus rho B, okay? Um, the, uh, if uh, the buyer is, is making the offer, it's the same thing. It's going to make the offer that is going to make the seller indifferent between accepting and not accepting, and then the price will be S plus rho S, okay? Now, if you look at the buyer's incentive to acquire information, which is really the key thing, well, as I told you, you want to acquire information, that's a, an important, important insight, is that you want to acquire information to avoid trade. You want to avoid buying lemons. Lemons have priority one minus rho, so you'll gain from being informed with priority one minus rho when you identify a lemon. Now, a lemon for the buyer has value B. I don't know, well, I see. Yeah, so the, the buyer has value B for a lemon, but he pays B plus rho B when the seller makes the offer. Okay, so he economizes, economizes rho B by not buying, and that has priority alpha S. When the buyer makes the offer, he pays S plus rho S, uh, but his real value is, is capital B. So here is the incentive to get uh, information for the buyer to get information. Key insight, if alpha B is positive, actually this incentive decreases with B minus S, capital B minus S, you know, from this expression. So if you have any bargaining power for the buyer, then the incentive to acquire information is going to decrease with B minus S. Put differently, if you trench, if you spin off the safe part, that means that B, B minus S is equal to zero. That means that your incentive to acquire information is very large, okay? And again, it's a no collateral damage effect. If you trench, if you don't trade the equity part, you also don't trade the safe part. So it's much less costly not to trade. And given that trade, trade is induced by the incentive to acquire information, um, then actually trenching is going to increase incentive to acquire information, uh, and that's going to be bad, okay? That's a collateral damage effect, okay? So, uh, you, well, I mean, from this, I don't have to go into the computations, but basically, you can fi easily find examples where the claim is perfectly liquid if you don't trench. If you trench, th it becomes illiquid, it creates asymmetric information and the seller is actually worse off. 
you make the creamy liquid. Okay, let me skip that. The next, the next possibility is to look at the informed seller case. So that's the other polar case. Imagine that we start from a situation we might be a primary market, for example, and the seller is informed. So his cost of information acquisition is equal to zero. So the question is whether the buyer will get informed. In that case, the seller actually would like the buyer to be informed because the seller would like symmetric information. Symmetric information is going to make the claim more liquid. So actually, in that case, the seller would like the buyer to be informed. So in the case, of an in if it's just the seller who's informed, then the seller actually get in gets a surplus. I've, I haven't shown that, but you can trust me, only, he makes a, only if he makes the offer, which has probability alpha s. If he learns that it's a high value asset, so it has value to him s plus s, he's going to keep it. He doesn't want to sell it, so he, he, that will have priority rho. With priority one minus rho, he will sell it, so lemon, he will sell it, and it's common knowledge that he will sell only lemons, and then he will sell at price B. Whereas if the buyer is informed, he's going to sell all the time, and then you can check the mass, he's going to actually make, um, he's going to make actually a higher surplus. I mean, because he's going to make, he's going to sell at, alf at B plus rho B when he makes the offer. So again, trenching is bad. I mean, this is the next condition, which I'm not going to go through. Trenching is bad, because when the seller is informed, you like the buyer to be informed. The incentive to acquire information increasing increases when, I mean, when you want, uh, sorry. The reason why you acquire, you acquire information in that case is to trade more, okay? You acquire information to trade more. Now, if you trench, you make non-trade less costly, and therefore it is bad. So again, you get an adverse effect of, effect of trenching. Okay, so in both cases, you do get a uh, collateral damage effect, which goes against trenching. Sorry. Second contribution of this paper is to introduce a model in which you can talk about velocity. So here I just rewrote uh, the timing, so there's nothing new on this slide, just to remind you of what's going on. So at odd periods, type one agents uh, convert cash value V into RV. In even periods, it's the reverse, okay? Um, I rewrote the buyer valuation and seller valuation just to remind you of, of the notation. So let's start from a non-informed equilibrium and ask yourself at what price is a claim going to trade on average. So if it's a non-informed equilibrium, you're going to end up with something which is very liquid, it's going to be traded fully all the time. So the average price will be with priority alpha as the seller makes an offer, then the price will be a high price P bar. And with priority alpha B, the buyer will make an offer and the price will be a low price P lower bar. Now, if you want to compute those two prices, just look at the case, for example, where the, buy, the seller makes an offer. The seller can offer a price P, which makes the buyer indifferent between accepting and not accepting. Now, how much is this asset worth to the buyer? Well, the discount factor is beta, and because there is no information around, the expected dividend is rho, uh, which is going to transfer into rho R. And tomorrow, we are looking at a steady state equilibrium. Tomorrow, that will be selling at an average price P, which again is going to be transformed into PR. So that gives you the expression of P bar. What about when the buyer makes an offer? When the buyer makes an offer, well, this price is going to be transformed by the seller into R P bar, P lower bar. The alternative for the buyer is to keep the asset. So if he keeps the asset, tomorrow he will get raw which he cannot transform tomorrow into ROR because he has no investment opportunity. And I told you tomorrow he will be buyer, so a buyer is not going to trade with buyer. There are no gains from trade, but the no trade result theorem is just going to wait one more period with the asset and then he's going to get beta P bar, basically. 
So that way we obtain parameter values for the existence of no non-informed equilibrium. Um, and let me just make one point, because here we are going to get in, we are, we are getting into the, the computations. I don't want to get into that, and I re-apologize. Clearly for a keynote lecture, there is more mathematics than is usual, so I apologize about this. But an important thing is that the non-informed equilibrium, again, which is an equilibrium in which nobody gets information, uh, say, I mean, here we just look at this uh, bias, um, incentive to acquire information, but the same results are true for the sellers, is more likely to exist when R is large. So actually, it's exactly what Bank was saying yesterday, which is that as long as the value of trading is large, so R, you know, the value of the gains from trade are very large, and you, you really want to trade the asset because there's maybe some scarcity of the asset or something like that, or good investment opportunities, then there are no questions asked. It's exactly what, what Bank was saying. Um, if you have a period where you know, there are lots of gains from trade, nobody looks at what's inside the asset, nobody tries to learn delta, and you end up with no information, a lot of liquidity, and it's wonderful. But of course, uh, that may no, no longer be the case, and you can, you, know, you can look at what happens where the seller gets informed, the buyer gets informed, or possibly both get informed. Now, the key point of this, uh, of this section, and here is a key insight I want you to remember, uh, beside all the computations that you will have forgotten in two minutes, is the following. If you, if you expect illiquidity tomorrow, so you, if you expect, for example, the buyer to get informed and the seller not to get informed of the reverse, so if you expect illiquidity tomorrow, it's going to create illiquidity today. So it's going to destroy the no, inf no information equilibrium, okay? So there's a feedback loop, it's self-fulfilling. If you expect that the asset will be liquid tomorrow, it's going to be liquid today. Now why is that? Well, I claim that you already know why. The reason for that comes from a static model. If you have illiquidity tomorrow, that means the continuation value of owning the asset is low. VS, what I call, is low. That means that the capital B and capital S of the static model, the safe part in a sense, will be low. It's as if you had done trenching, in a sense. If you, have I if you expect illiquidity tomorrow, you reduce a fixed value. It's as if you had done trenching, and trenching is bad. And you reduce illiquidity to you, you in induce liquidity to death. So I think that's, that's a result I, I like quite a lot. It's actually the self-fulfilling uh, uh, aspect that illiquidity tomorrow creates illiquidity today. Okay. And you can have multiple equilibria because of that. Okay, so take our own points and I'm going to conclude here and maybe leave a few minutes for questions. The literature stresses the benefit of creating safe security. Safe security being low value of information acquisition, low information intensity. The point we are making here is that creating, the first point, there are two points, is that creating a safe claim also means increasing the riskiness of the left, leftover claim. If you create a, s a safe claim, you also create a more risky claim. And it's not clear a priori how the overall liquidity will be affected. Trenching reduces the cost of disagreement. There is no longer a collateral damage effect of not trading if you tr don't trade the equity part, that's fine because you're still able to trade the debt part. If the other part is informed, then uninformed, then it encourages information acquisition, precisely when information collection is socially bad. If the other part is informed, it discourages information acquisition, precisely when information collection is socially good. Trenching may reduce liquidity and welfare. It doesn't always, but it may. And the second big point I, I just made is that perception of future liquidity is going to be self-fulfilling and is going to create current illiquidity. Finally, let me just say that uh, there may be other applications to that. And, you know, I, I don't know, uh, but and we certainly haven't done 
there might be application outside security, outside security design. One thing, having worked on climate change uh, and being interested in negotiations in general, uh, which is dear to me is whether you should have lump sum negotiation or piecemeal negotiation. I mean, before Copenhagen, there was actually quite a lot of pressure to have item by item or sectoral uh, negotiation uh, for, for Copenhagen. And you know, there are also effects going on, and uh, I could talk about that, but it's not the point. And same thing, uh, whenever you negotiate uh, something with the union or in Congress and so on, you always have this to decide whether you do it item by item or, or globally. And you know, these this effects of liquidity and no collateral damage effects will be around in those applications as well. Finally, and this is not mine, let me uh, shift the blame to Elu Fontad, and I was mentioning society to him, and say, why don't you apply this to Glass-Steagall, okay? Uh, Glass-Steagall Act, uh, separating commercial banks and investment banks, um, in a sense, I, 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 was, I was very surprised when he told me that, but he said, well, commercial banks is a low information uh, intensity activity, the investment bank is a high information intensity, activity and Glass-Steagall basically did some trenching of the, all that. Now, I don't know what the answer is and whether we can re reframe, but of course the investor then being the people who, the investors who lend to the bank. Um, well, you know, what is going to change our incentive to acquire information, I don't know, but I, I leave that to you as a puzzle and I hope you'll solve it for me. Thank you very much. Minutes for questions, which is uh, 